It's incredible. The dough is a mix of wheat flour, sugar, salt, milk, butter, and baking powder. It reacts a little bit like uh, a puff pastry. It puffs up slightly initially, so all those, all those little cuts just open up. You see my sad attempt. So you can see them all open up, and you can see where the fire's just scorched. It's a little bit hot, but interesting pattern. It smells like a donut. <laughs> it's like the snowflakes that kids cut out of paper. Utterly charming. Who did that one? This is uh, Hayna. That's a good one, that one. It's nice. Whoa. That's a monster, that one, isn't it? It's good, though. I think when they stop sizzling, it's telling you when it's ready. It's like you were born and raised in the north. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm from Liverpool. <laughs> And to serve them, mm. just spread with Icelandic butter and crunch. It's not like a pancake. It's like a bread, but with the texture of a cracker. That's what it's like. It's like a cracker. It's a cracker with butter on it. They're delicious. They are. Really nice, yeah. At the end of my journey, this is a reminder of Iceland's tough and frugal history. A time before the richness of international baking arrived. Honestly, they're really good. And it's great to see Dango's kids having such quiet fun making them. You're a busy man. Thank you. Thank you very much you do. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What a brilliant family. I'm going to have to try that when I get home. I've had a hectic but memorable time in Iceland. But before I leave, Askia's team at Sandholt Bakery have kindly let me come back and borrow a workbench. I'm going to bake something that's caught my eye in a few of the bakeries I've visited. Now what I'm gonna make is Vina Teta. Well, let me show you this. These are a few of the examples that you get in Reykjavik. So this one is made with buttercream, this one is made with jam, and this one is made with prune. What it is is a layered cake or a layered biscuit, and this has almost become their national dish. Now the one I'm going to use to make is basically oats, so I'm going to make it an oatmeal biscuit, and I'm going to sandwich in between chocolate buttercream. It's very simple to make. So to start with, I'm going to cream the butter and the sugar together. It shouldn't take very long at all. It just goes slightly paler yellow. When it's fluffy, pour in the beaten eggs and some vanilla. And then I'm going to add the flour, the baking powder, a little bit at a time to this mixture. And then we've got oatmeal. Again, the reason why I'm using this, it's Icelandic. Barley and oats were grown in this country, so I'm trying to keep it as close to Iceland as possible. Blend the oats through the rest of the ingredients. With that, I'm just going to put a little bit of flour on here and bring them together on the bench for a moment. Now I need to get the dough ready for rolling out those layers. This is going to go in the fridge to chill down for a little bit, it just helps you roll it out. While it chills, get the filling ready. You could use jam or a fruit compote but I'm using icing sugar, butter, and melted chocolate beaten into a smooth paste. There it is, that's the buttercream, done. Slightly stiffened from the fridge, the dough should now be easier to roll out. Take your time doing this, don't rush it. Now this is the thing I'm using to cut. So we are gonna get through. I'm sure Iceland's grandmothers never wasted a crumb, so neither will I. You should have just enough to roll out a fourth layer. Just dock it all the way down, just to prevent them from rising up too much. 
Then pop your biscuit layers in the oven for 15 to 20 minutes and they should be golden brown. Okay, there are our baked layers. Build it up using a third of the filling each time. Don't worry about going right to the end because what's going to happen, we're going to trim this down anyway. So you see the biscuit, you see the buttercream. Another layer on top and repeat. Last layer on top. Traditionally, Vina Turta is left for a day or so before trimming as the biscuit will soften a little. But I'm just getting away with doing it now. Don't waste the trimmings, they're a great baker's pick. A little bit of icing sugar on the top, I think you'd be good to go. There you have it, Vina Turta, straight from Iceland. Reykjavik has been one city-based destination that I've found full of surprises. I expected it to be snowy, and yes, found snow up on the plateau. I didn't expect it to be this wet. I thought the Icelandic people wouldn't be as friendly. I was wrong. I think they are very, very friendly people. The way that humans have adapted to this island, and the fact that it's so barren, so remote, is incredible. Icelandic people have had to travel back to mainland Europe to learn new skills and actually bring them back to Iceland and make it their own. That's what they've been doing on the bread front and the cake front. I think Iceland is a fascinating place. Yes, I've fallen in love with Reykjavik, the city. тысяч человек кругляет стоимость поездок на такси в пользу благотворительных фондов и их подопечных. Вы тоже можете включить эту функцию в приложении Яндекс.Го. Станьте новыми друзьями для тех, кто в этом нуждается. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world. I'm covering the tastes, traditions and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm. Welcome to City Bakes. On City Bakes, I discover a hidden gem of a baking city. A place I knew nothing about, but where I find that everything I love is of the highest quality imaginable. Proper chocolate. I uncover some historic bakes. It's fantastic. And I go behind the scenes of the world famous diamond industry. Oh, I can see it, yeah. I try traditional dishes with a Michelin star twist. These look like pan chocolat. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. And I show you how to bake my chocolate layer cake. You have the waffle mixture and you have the Belgian chocolate on the top. Welcome to City Bakes in Antwerp. The classic way for travellers to come into Antwerp is by train. What an incredible way to arrive. This is the prettiest station. I think I've ever been to. Antwerp station actually is over 400 meters in length from the beginning over there right to the end. And every single square meter is decorated. So this is the first thing you see when you arrive in Antwerp. Statement piece, isn't it? If this is their station, I wonder what their baking will be like. I can't believe I've never even been to Belgium before. 
They've created some of my favorite foods here. It's one of the top foodie destinations in Europe. So, I want to find out why it produces some of the best products and what makes them so special. My first port of call isn't going to be a bake, but they are one of the most popular things here to eat. Chips. You can't come to Belgium without trying the Belgian frit, or to you and me, chips. Now, they were made famous here in the 1700s. This is where the chip was invented. We know them as the French fry, but that is wrong. It's the Belgian fry. For a country of just 10 million people, there are more than 5,000 frit stalls like this one. Uh, could I have some frits, please? We'll make it a big one, please. Okay. Thank you. Chips. American soldiers came here in World War I, and because the Belgian people were speaking French, they call it the French fry. So that was the problem. Can you imagine a whole nation being upset? Because actually, it's the Belgian fry, not the French fry. They don't normally put vinegar on the chips. You serve it with a sauce. It's all about the sauces here. It's dead posh. I've asked for curry sauce, simple mayo, and a retro cocktail. The cocktail one I don't like. I don't know, it's too bitter. Curry one's quite nice. But there's more to Antwerp than its fantastic frites. The city is dwarfed by its port. It's the second biggest in Europe and dates back to the Middle Ages. Today, it's the size of nearly 20,000 football pitches. Antwerp was a very industrial city. The Spanish who conquered Belgium were on little trots down to South America, bringing back the cacao beans, bringing back coffee, and ultimately, sugar. Where you have trade, you have money. This became a very, very wealthy city. You can see this in the stunning architecture, but I wonder if you can see the wealth reflected in their bakes. I've arranged to meet food writer Luke Horney. He reviews and researches Antwerp gastronomy. Luke, oh, nice to meet you, buddy. One of his favorite places is Goosen's, the oldest bakery in Antwerp. History of a city for me lies in two things, pubs and bakeries. <laughs> Not after my own heart. Yeah, since it's too early to go to a pub, yeah. bakery's a second choice. Baking's always my first choice. I tell you what, it's crowded, isn't it? It's always crowded. This place is always crowded. That's a good sign, no? It is a good sign. It means that the stuff in here is pretty good. This delightful place has been in the same family since 1884. Along with their more modern European bakes, there are a few unusual ones I've never seen before. One of the things here that they do is an Alcazar, which is in fact an ancient recipe based on frangipan and, and pineapple. In those days, it's quite a, quite a thing to get pineapples over here. So this is due to the port and all the, all the trade that was going on. You've got pastry. Yeah. It could be a jam, and then it looks like Frenchy pan. It's Afro jam, and then you have pineapples yeah. in there as well. This is this is a pastry which was been made for centuries. Mm. It's delicious though. The almonds in there, the Frenchy pan, is fantastic. Yeah. I like that a lot. It was destined for the rich mm. at that place to show off. And there's another fancy loaf that's caught my eye. What is this? A rogo verdumke. The little little translation is bread for the damned because people who were damned or were, were poor, they got slices of this from the rich. But you got, you're gonna order one of those breads. Right. It's called a rogo verdumeke. Say that Let's, again? A, a rogo verdumeke. Can I order a rofa verdukene? Well, I think you mean this. <laughs> That's the one, yeah. <laughs> you, you speak well. English, it's yeah. too fine. In the 17th century, the wealthy were so rich they could afford to give away expensive loaves like this one. Okay, so that's a cross section of it. See all the raisins in it. That tight structure is a real indication that it's a rye bread. Oh. When you've got raisins in a loaf like that, the flavor and the moisture that it carries to the bread is fantastic. It's a great loaf. I'd have that everyday taste of a little bit of butter. 
Now what's this one? This is this is even richer. It's um, it contains more yeast. It's lighter. Oh yeah. But it's full of candied fruit. Candy again. That's candied showing fruit. off money. And this is called uh, sukkah. Yeah. Sukkah. It's tender. Suckable. It's like a panettone meets a brioche. Yeah. That's what it's like. It's got really soft dough. The flavour of the citrus comes through. It's rich. It's sugary. But it's also got a little bit of a bite to it as well, that little bit of bitterness that comes from the, the fruit, the citrus in there. There's nothing cheap in that. No. The celebration of breads that are from Antwerp, they're the ones that are expensive. They're the ones that have got huge amounts of buttery, huge amounts of eggs, huge amounts of fruit. That is a massive indication that there's a lot of money here. Anybody from outside Belgium came here, looked at them and went, wow. People who live in Antwerp, who are born and born and raised in Antwerp, we adore our city, we love our city. And people who are not from the city sometimes consider that as showing off. But we're just very proud of what we are and, and where we come from. Oh boy, I get a strong feeling that this might be a city I'm going to enjoy exploring. One of the country's most famous products is, of course, the chocolate. Now, I've been baking with Belgian chocolate for years. So why this connection with chocolate in Belgium? And Belgian chocolate rolls off the tongue, but where did that come from? You will see Antwerp in the 17th century, one of the richest cities. 40% uh, of the European economy went through this city. Mm -hmm. And cacao beans was one of their major products to, 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 to sell. So we tried, we made a drink out of it. Hot chocolate was a drink of choice for the wealthy, who were trying to impress their friends. Cafes all over the city still make it fresh every morning. Oh, that flavour is... it's very Moorish. It's got a nice consistency to it, nice and thick, proper chocolate. It is. And this thing made chocolate famous. But how did this drinking chocolate then move into the bars of chocolate that we know now? Yeah, yeah we, we needed some help. That help was a very clever Dutchman, Conrad Johannes van Houten. In 1828, he made a discovery. Well, then he invented the machine which could, like, crush the cacao beans and get out the, the butter and leave the powder. Because then we had solid matter, in fact, to make, to turn this drink into a chocolate bar, to something solid. The next big step in chocolate production was the filled chocolate. And if we look here, this guy invented it. This guy? Yeah, this guy is the called No House. So you know the small yeah, bite-sized yeah. things filled with ganache, filled with yeah. whatever. John Newhouse got the idea for the filled chocolate from his pharmacist grandfather, who had covered his medicines in chocolate to make them palatable. This is the heart of something we all take for granted. That box of chocolates we get for Christmas is all down to him. So let's, let's, tr let's try some. My first experience of a Belgian chocolate shop. Bring it on. So here we are really at the beginning of Belgian chocolates. This guy invented it in 1912. This is a pudding he made for the World Exposition in 1958, wow. which is still unchanged since then. So let's try that. The Belgians even have a certain way to actually eat chocolate. If you, if you taste a chocolate, you must you, you really yes. appreciate the, the filling. So bite half of it like this. Mm. So get all the layers together. It tastes amazing. Quite chewy as well. Yeah. It's probably rude just to try one. I particularly like white chocolate. So. Thank you very much. It's a very nice one. Now this. Enjoy it, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Now the thing is about these are filled chocolates. This is the thing that made the difference. Yeah. Once the praline went inside, or the ganache, yeah. then that was owned by yeah. this guy that started yeah, the, chocolate, yeah, yeah. the chocolate movement. Yeah, correct. And he actually changed how the world looks at chocolate. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 The original filled chocolate. Another reason to adore Antwerp. But it's not just chocolate they do exceptionally well. Luke's pointed me in the direction of a chef who's known for his unique bake. This restaurant has held a Michelin star for over 30 years. And the chef, Johan Segers, produces some of the best food in Antwerp. Here at Tifornis, 
Johan takes traditional Belgian dishes and transforms them into extraordinary plates of food. But it's his famous bake I want to see. These look like pan au chocolat. No, whoa, 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 that's a big difference. <laughs> there certainly is. These are, believe it or not, Michelin starred sausage rolls. Why are you making sausage rolls in a Michelin starred yes. restaurant? I have a better name. Wurstenbrot. Yeah, that's, Wurstenbrot. that's, that's Flemish, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the Wurstenbrot wasn't always served in a fancy restaurant. Its roots go back to the 1920s, when Antwerp stock workers used to get drunk in the bars. The owners would give them free sausage rolls to sober them up, so they could keep spending their money on drink. It's a bar <laughs> snack, there you have it. Yeah. Antwerp bar snack, sausage roll. Yeah. Can I try one, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. They Absolutely. smell amazing. Yeah. So what's in these? What have you got? That's a mix from veal and pork. It's beautifully crispy on the outside. Mm -hmm. Soft and buttery on the inside. You talk, I eat. Okay. No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You go ahead. Pastry is more like a bread. Yeah, it's very light. It is like a brioche almost. Crispy, a little bit. But inside you have this gorgeous pork and veal that runs all the way through it. That's very, very good. My dad made sausage rolls in his bakery when I grew up, but Scouse ones were never this posh. I'm intrigued to find out how Johan makes his. So, that's the meat. This is this is very top end. So you have a good quality pork yeah. and good quality veal. Absolutely. So that's for me very important. What we do, we put it three eggs inside. Three? Yeah. A little bit of milk. A little bit of milk, okay. Bread, bread corn also inside. That's quite then Make it a little bit light. Yes. A bit of seasoning. That's uh, we taste. A little bit more pepper. You taste raw meat. Absolutely. Yeah. Each to their own. It's not even mixed. The filling is combined, then it's wrapped in a sweet, butter enriched dough and left to prove. I've never seen um, a sausage roll made with a croissant dough before, so that, that is different to me. Yeah, that's a, a specialty. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's the yeah. food of the common man, but this yeah. is the posh yeah. version. Okay, <laughs> that's uh, time. Then it's into the oven for 15 minutes. Sausage roll is such a basic thing, but what Johan's done is given it the Michelin star effect, created something that is simply divine. Coming up, I get a sneaky peek into the world of the diamond dealer. In each store you will see it has its own charm. Not every store is the same. And Johan and I join forces and put a twist on a famous Flemish stew. I love the crunch on those potatoes. I'm exploring Antwerp, and I'm heading away from the city centre to the old Jewish district. This community has been here for over 800 years, and many of the Jewish people work in Antwerp's famous diamond industry. Now I've heard just around the corner is the Del Rey Patisserie, where Bernard Prout produces some of the finest cakes in the city. Me, pastries? Oh yes. Lovely to meet you. I'm full. Nice to meet you. Now looking down here, they're beautiful. It's bavoise, it's mousses, it's brulees. Bernard has created over 30 designs which change seasonally. And getting this level of precise finish on each one is a testament to his perfectionist character. Each cake is like a little diamond. What you've got here is absolutely stunning. How long have you been doing this? I'm here already for more than 30 years. Quite a long time. Wow. Quality baking like this takes time and doesn't come cheap. But Bernard has customers who can afford the best. We have the locals, we have the Jewish community, we have also the international public from the diamond business is just in our bag. Every cake is made in the bakery beneath the shop. This is where it all happens then. Yes. And it looks like he's got all manner of gadgets to make his fancy cakes including a spray gun. Yes. 
so you've got a compressor as well yes like in garage <laughs> you have as well <laughs> yeah Excellent. go with your tires <laughs> yeah that's right yeah it's like being in Willy Wonka's factory and then some I mean a compressor with a spray gun so we're basically going to spray a car now in a booth but we're going to spray a cake instead Bernard's decorating one of his most popular cakes the vanilla and passion fruit bavoie He's spraying raspberry chocolate on a butterfly stencil. His attention to detail is incredible. Okay. Do you see? Yeah. Want to do it? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's easy, yeah? If you fancy doing this at home, I suggest you take your cake to the local garage. I need one of these in my life. It's too much on there, isn't it? Right. Sorry, I messed up. No problem. <laughs> I went to art school too. Clearly not up to scratch, but I better leave it to the expert. For extra wow factor, Bernard creates a 3D effect using tempered chocolate. When the chocolate is tempered, we put it on the transfer. We, it's like you have this one, but then yep. the other side. This isn't just a cake, it's a work of art. And then we put... Uh, And put it like that. That's why we have the 3D. The idea of spray painting and giving it a 3D effect with the tempered chocolate on the outside, the raspberry holding it up, it's so delicate and beautiful that when you look at it as a whole cake, it is absolutely divine. Thanks, Chef. Your kitchen is amazing, by the way. Thank, Thank you very much, indeed. Thank you. There are more treasures just around the corner because Antwerp's diamond district is right on his doorstep. So I'm hooking up with Lisbeth Morellis, an official from the diamond industry here in Antwerp. You're in a diamond square mile, but don't be mistaken, it's not all glitter and glamour here as you can see because it's business to business. I did expect it to be a little bit more... Fancy, yeah. you can say it. This whole area is completely dedicated to diamonds. 84% of every rough diamond passes through Antwerp. Wow. We have the labs to certify the diamonds. We will sort the diamonds because every type of company needs to know what type of diamond they need. Diamonds have been trading here for 500 years and the city turns over an incredible, wait for it, $57 billion a year. Have to go to security. Elizabeth has agreed to take me behind the scenes to show me where the really big deals take place. This is the bourse, where traditionally traders buy and sell. It's not quite what I was expecting a trading floor to look like. Everything is based on trust. If we have a deal, we say Mazalo Bracha, may, Mazalo this, Bracha. Mazalo Bracha, may this deal bring you good luck. When we've shaken, the deal stands. There'll be no handshakes from me today, but I'm keen to see some rough diamonds. Trader David has agreed to show me a selection. How can I help you? For me, I'm, I'm fascinated with the whole world of diamonds. Uh, uh, these are not cut diamonds, these are rough diamonds. Right. Right. So, when you look at that, they don't look very special. I have um, low quality diamonds, yeah. but you can see that still, there's life in it. Oh, there's a see? mark inside yeah, there, isn't it? Of course. It? You want to check? Please do. You will see it. Oh, I can see it, yeah. So in each stone, you will see it has its own charm. Can you tell a vivid color at, at the rough diamond stage? Of course, yeah. That's all the. This is all the, the business. This is the game that we play. So if I get a, a stone like this one, mm -hmm. and let's say you see it's off color, and another guy sees and he checks it and he sees, listen, I think I can make a fancy color out of it. Then that's the beauty of the rough diamond. Fancy colored diamonds have a natural color caused by the presence of other elements like nitrogen or boron. And the way that the diamond is cut and polished affects the intensity of the color and therefore the price. So what sort of value do you think you're looking at there in total? The whole value together. Yeah. I don't know, you have a No. No. <laughs> but let's say, this is 337 carats, mm -hmm. so the price for this is around the $350 per carat. That's nearly $118,000 right there. Incredible.
but there's no deal for me today. With my hands firmly in my pockets, it's time to get back to what I know best, food. Whilst I'm in a city, I like to create a bake. And my pal Johan has invited me back to taste the fantastic seasonal stew he has on his menu this time of year. How are you doing, Johan? He's safe. Nice to see you, my friend. Here I am. As a northerner, I'm partial to a good stew, and I can't wait to collaborate with this Michelin-starred chef and add my twist to his dish. OK, tell me about this. It's a Flemish stew, isn't it, really? Yes, that's carbonate flamande. Okay. Um, that's a good meat, onions, beer, very simple. Oh, I'd love to see the way you do it. Okay, first thing I want to do, that's maybe for you, I need one onion. Okay. Okay, that's, uh, that's okay for you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so, Chief, that's the meat, the Wagyu beef. Unbelievable. Antwerp pulls it out again. It's Wagyu beef. Wagyu is one of the most expensive beefs you can buy in the world. These are specifically reared and massaged, so you get a fat lining all the way through, and it, the fat is where the flavour is in the meat. Other cuts like shin and brisket will work just fine. Johan sautés onions in oil and butter, then seasons the meat before browning in a pan. We need now a nice baked core. Yeah, you're looking for that the wrong side. Yeah, yeah. So you've got thyme in there, you've got a bay leaf in there. In goes that amazing wagyu. Just plain flour. Yeah. And this oh, is oh, going to oh, thicken oh. the sauce. Yeah, right? yeah, with a little bit. Okay. And here's the secret touch Belgian beer. Rich, dark, and full of caramel flavours. At home, I would use stock cubes, but of course, Johan makes his own shoe. In all the big hotels, five stars, when I was at the Dorchester, my job was skimming the top of the stock. And it's all done with the bones. Yeah. So you have all the vegetables in it, yeah, you have all the big bones in there. Big stock pots like this. Absolutely. And it reduces, 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 and it sets like a jelly. Johan's also adding mustard, but in a way I've never seen before. That's a lot of mustard. The bread will dissolve and help thicken the stew. It's finished, the job is finished. The rich Flemish stew <laughs> has been cooked for an hour. This recipe couldn't be any simpler. I can't wait to try it. It's the absolutely drop dead gorgeous thing. This is... That's, this is too much. <laughs> it's, no, it's not. <laughs> no, seriously, it's not. <clears throat> With the Wagyu, it breaks down, it melts, and the beer with that beautiful beef shoe. Together, that is one of the best stews I've ever had in my life. I love you, chef. <laughs> wow, it's nice, isn't it? Wow. But I've come round here to bake. The problem I've got now is I want to try and put my little touch to it to make it a little bit different. That's a potato, yeah, I know. But, but, uh... Can you make a couple of chips from that for me, please? Chips? Chips. Yeah. Yep, chips. I've decided to go simple. And you know what? Sometimes that's just enough. It is. Yes. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good deal. <laughs> I work and you work. Now, I'm basing this on like a Lancashire hot pot. Now, a Lancashire hot pot traditionally has potatoes on top of it. So, what I'm going to do is actually layer them onto the top. One layer and then cross them across the top. So, basically, you have your beautiful stew underneath. Yeah. You have the potatoes on the top, which means seasons, got a little bit of clarified butter on it. Yeah. That will have to go back in the oven now. The chips should cook on top. Yeah. So we're going to have frits with your beautiful yeah. stew underneath it. Thank you. 
after 20 minutes in the oven, our Flemish stew collaboration is complete. You eat it together. Oh, yeah. You meat and the chips together. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Try this on a cold evening using a quality waxy potato and your leftover stew. It's just perfect. I love the crunch on those potatoes. It's fantastic, but it shows together. These are crispy, lots of flavour, well seasoned, and with that stew underneath. Wow, I think it's delicious. Thank you very much indeed, Chef. I know, I think you. You've got to try this at home. Ah, Antwerp, I'm learning to love you. Coming up, I head out to sea in search of another of my favourite foods. That is what you call a very special muscle. And I visit a Jewish bakery that stood the test of time. We've worked in a lot of bakeries around the world, but I've never worked in a bakery that has a heart. I'm in Antwerp, a small Belgium city that I've discovered is big on surprises. From the best sausage roll I've ever eaten, that's very, very good, to incredible frites. Cheers. Last night, I dined out on a famous Belgian delicacy, mussels. Look at that for a mussel. But to discover why they taste so amazing in Antwerp, I was told I had to get up early. It's 6 a.m. in the morning, and no, I'm not on my way to my bakery. I'm actually on my way to check out where Antwerp gets all their mool or their mussels, which they're so famous for. Happy days. Mussels are one of my favorite foods, and I'm not alone. Belgians consume 60,000 tons of them a year. The mussels I ate last night were harvested just 30 minutes outside the city, on the border of Belgium and the Netherlands. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Fisherman Martin has agreed to take me out on his ship to collect some. I don't often get out to sea. What a great way to start the day. Same sea, same tidal thing. Yeah. We're heading out to an arm of the North Sea, where most of Belgian mussels come from. And what is it about this particular waters that produce the best mussels in the world? Well, it's a combination. You've got, like, very nutritious water. Also, the movement of the tide lets the mussels work. And they have to hold on against the elements, against predators, against everything. And that just makes them uh, sturdy and meatier. They plump up. Yeah, no, they're, they're going to be strong and firm meat. The mussels are grown and harvested further out to sea. Then they're brought closer to shore and stored here. That's actually where we're going now. To pick them up. To pick them up. This area produces a massive 65 million kilos of mussels a year. That's incredible. Huge chainmail nets scoop the living mussels up from the shallow seabed below us. Look over here. Look at that. Some mussels. Wow. Right from. I can the... almost smell the frets. Yeah. <laughs> They're lovely you there. Can, you can't get them any fresher than this. No, you can't. They are actually a decent size. They're a nice size mussel. Yeah. Once the mussels are harvested, they go back to the shore to be cleaned, then delivered straight to the restaurant in Antwerp. But I can't wait that long. Nice and cleaned up. Perfect, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thankfully, the wheelhouse has somewhere to prepare breakfast. Cheers. Oh, it's a bit warm right here, isn't it? Like so, heat up the stove. So within five minutes of them coming out of the sea, they're in the pot, they're going to be cooked, we're going to eat them. Nice. So, let's look inside. Look at that. Roll open. Mm -hmm. So that means they're ready. Oh, they smell lovely. It's the smell of the sea. At eight o'clock in the morning, it's a mighty sight. Right, should we have a go? Mm. It tastes good. It's it really nice good, yeah. There's saltiness to it. Yeah. And a firm taste. It's plump, it's delicious, and it's a little. 
little taste of the sea. They're really, really good. This is the real thing. That is what you call a very special mussel. With a belly full of mussels, it's time I headed back to land. Now, Antwerp is a pretty compact city and fairly easy to get around using the tram. I'm going back to the Jewish neighborhood I was in yesterday to visit one of the city's most popular bakeries. Kleinblatt has been baking bread in Antwerp since the 1920s. It's at the heart of the Jewish community, with third generation baker Henry at the helm. Hello, Henry. This bakery is unlike the ones I grew up with. It adheres strictly to Jewish law and a rabbi visits daily to ensure everything is certified kosher. What do you do then to make sure that the, the rules are followed? Well, it's quite simple. The first thing is the products that are used here. Yeah. There are certain items, well, according to the Bible, you must not use, so let's say, fat from an animal. Yeah. Then, I have to crack up every, every egg that comes in. I've cracked it in millions of eggs. <laughs> okay. And we have to check that there's no blood inside. Yes. Why no blood? Because for us in the Bible, it says a person may not eat blood. Yes. The second part is that every morning I come in, I bless all the doors that have been done. Okay. That's that. With the dough now blessed, we can start making the special holler bread. <sighs> Getting a little bit up. Holler is a Jewish plaited loaf that's served traditionally on the Sabbath. It's the centerpiece of the religious Shabbat dinner. As today is Friday, head baker Adolf has to plat 1,500 of these. I reckon I can help. Well, you want to look first how he does it? Look at the speed. <laughs> I need to have a go at this. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is hard. Push enough, then you'll have them longer. Yeah. Like how can you learn this in two seconds? <laughs> that is really difficult to do. What the biggest problem is when you're doing this, which I hugely respect him for, is getting them all the same. I can normally do an eight strand plat dead easy too. I was a bit of a hindrance. But there's some bread just come out the oven. Tasting, I can definitely do. Just freshly baked. Yeah. Mm. It's good. It's good bread. Yeah. It's very good bread. Henry's family have been serving the community for more than eight years. The only time the bakery has had to shut down is during World War II. The Germans came and they took the ovens because they weren't made from nothing. Special metal they used to make them tanks. So they took everything out. That's incredible. Yeah. Then after the war, when they reopened the bakery, many people were without jobs. So my grandmother, she gave them a job. And I hear from people that they had a grandfather working for us and a grandmother working for us. It was quite interesting to see the social impact it had uh, during those days. Yeah. And there's one thing that we see, that is that people have and the nostalgia of the bakery here. I can appreciate the love that they put into each of their loaves, from the rabbi to the bakers. It's actually quite touching. So I've worked in a lot of bakeries around the world but I've never worked in a bakery that has a heart. This bakery has a big heart. Coming up, I'm in biscuit heaven. And this one, oh, we got more. <laughs> and I show you how to bake my indulgent chocolate layer cake. You have the waffle mixture and you have the Belgium chocolate on the top. I'm discovering that Antwerp is rather a hidden gem, and I've just found a baker that makes nothing but thousands of handmade biscuits. Ah, hello. 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 Philip de Cours has been making biscuits for 28 years. He's following in the footsteps of this city's biscuit baking tradition. 
about one hundred and fifty years ago there were more than twenty big factories in the center of antwerp the people of antwerp are clearly discerning demanding thirty varieties with their morning coffee what makes a good biscuit to you a good biscuit starts uh, with the right sugar because it's the sugar which gives the structure on your cookie i can let you taste the difference this okay. This one is with a, a, a rougher, a bigger sugar. Yeah, more like a caster sugar, yeah. more granulated, yeah. This is with melt sugar. I boil, boil them a little bit. Ah, okay. This boiled sugar. This man really knows his biscuit baking. You see the difference in the structure? Mm. The big difference for me in that is the melting quality. Yeah. It melts much, much quicker with the, the one with the caster. And this one? Oh, well, more... <laughs> I'm going to struggle leaving this shop. Yeah. And this one? The midwinter festivals, Philip also makes the biggest biscuit I've ever seen. I'll break up a little bit of the fluff. Where's the tea? That's nice to put in your coffee. That is a great dunker that he puts into his biscuits really come through when you actually come to taste it. It's all about the freshness and believe me, it makes a huge difference. To be honest, every single one of those biscuits tasted unbelievable. You may have spotted one Belgian bake missing from my visit so far. Well, don't worry. Before I leave Antwerp, I'm stopping off for Belgian waffles. Tamara Tomic has invited me to her family's shop, and in the city of waffle shops everywhere, she is sure of her position. I am the best. You want to know? Yes, please. I'll show you. Bizarrely, they don't call them Belgian waffles here. That was the name made up to sell them to the Americans in the 1960s. Here, they're known as the Brussels waffle. I thought I'd come here to taste them, but Tamara has other ideas. So every morning, we uh, make the butter. Full fat milk. Yeah. And then you can add 10 eggs, please. 10 eggs? Yeah. Shells and all? No. Thank you. <laughs> I'm adding plain flour, vanilla, salt and yeast to make the batter. You're doing it very well. How much do you pay? You're just learning still. But you can eat waffles. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. I'll get paid in waffles. Yeah. Paid in waffles and beer. Wait until you try them, you're gonna be happy that you're gonna be paid in waffles. Let's go make waffles then. Okay. Upstairs, all the waffles are made on six gas fired waffle irons. The waffle is really the best waffle because when you put it in, the heat is coming immediately into the iron and making the waffle. Uh, crusty on the outside and really soft in the inside. You want to try one? Go on. You do it in the middle and you turn left. We can do it with the... Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no. They serve around 500 waffles on a busy day. That's some going. It's not as easy as it looks, you know. Oh, no. This one is for me and this one's for you. I'm making a right pig's ear of this one. Okay, just leave it alone. Leave it alone, get it back in. I'll okay, hide here. that one. This one? It's really difficult. I think... Ah, there you go. I think when you're doing this sort of thing, it's about a technique. You want to try one? I should really, shouldn't I? Yeah, you can try yours. Like it? I think yeah. it's probably the best waffle I've ever had in my life. It's so light. These are like little clouds, but with the cream as well, blended together. Sorry, I'm going to get back to me waffles. It looks amazing. Thank you. Turn around. What's happened there? You were too slow to turn it. Was that what it was? Uh, Men can't do two things at the same time. True. <laughs> I'm nearly at the end of my time here in Antwerp, and before I leave, I want to make something that reminds me of the city. 
so i've decided to create my own desserts using summer tomorrow's waffle batter mixture i'm going to show you how to make my indulgent chocolate layer cake so to start with i need the waffle mixture can i take some of this yes, of waffle course. mixture thank you this is very similar to a pancake batter, but there's yeast in here for extra rise. So I'm going to add a little bit of sugar to this, and a little bit of sugar to this. I'll also, in one of them, I'm going to add some cocoa powder straight in. This is where your chocolate layers come from. This is an 8 inch tin. All I've done is put a little bit of grease beef down the bottom. And I'm going to put a layer of batter in here. So take one scoop of the mixture, pour it in, take that down to the side, then stick your tin under the grill for about a minute. Happy with that? So the first layer is in, you've got that browning on the top, which just indicates that this mixture is actually cooked already. The next layer will be a chocolate one. Again, this will give you a great distinction between the white and the chocolate, the white and the chocolate. We're going to do 10 layers, five of each. Swirl the mixture evenly around the tin, then it's under the grill again. Lovely. Second layer of chocolate. You can see that it's cooked. See that it's cracked around the side? Okay, so that is the chocolate. Keep going like this, building up your alternating layers until you're near the top of your tin. Then let your layer cake cool. Now I've done the last one, so I'm just going to release the cake, which it now is. And you can see all those beautiful layers. As I'm in Antwerp, a cake can't have enough Belgian chocolate. So this is chocolate. This is basically ganache, so it's equal amount of chocolate to cream. You want a pouring consistency, not too thick, because what we're going to do now is basically pour it over the top of the cake. Carefully cover all the cake with chocolate, making sure it's nice and smooth. Then delicately pipe lines of melted white chocolate on top. Then just get the back of a blade and just draw your blade through it one way and then another. And that is the finishing touches to something which actually is a little bit special. This is my indulgent chocolate layer cake. It's light and the smooth chocolate adds richness. What you've got is a celebration of Belgium. You have the waffle mixture and you have the Belgium chocolate on the top. Look at the layers all the way through. I like it, but what does my waffle boss think? Pretty good. Almost as good as my waffle. Ah, those Antwerpians, so sure of themselves. I can't quite believe I've never explored the sensational baking of this quiet little city before. Everything I've encountered here in Antwerp is so simple, but so special. You can see the city's wealth and richness reflected in their amazing food. I've tried historical bakes and tasted the best mussels ever. That is what you call a very special mussel. I've met locals that are keeping food traditions alive and seen simple dishes transformed into something quite remarkable. That is one of the best stews I've ever had in my life. <laughs> we brush you over Antwerp thinking, oh, it's just a little city in Belgium. It's not. It's a foodie capital. It's the foodie capital, I would say, of Northern Europe. I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world, uncovering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Yeah, I'm Welcome to City Base.
City Bakes has taken me on a journey of discovery all around the world, but this show is special. I'm taking you back to somewhere I love. Today, I'm in Cyprus, where I lived and worked for six years. In 1996, I left my job at the Dorchester Hotel in London, throwing caution to the wind to make a new life in the sun. It'd be nice to catch up with a few old friends if they're around. For the first time in over a decade, I'm going back to the kitchens I once spent hundreds of hours in. It's weird wearing whites and being in the Annabelle kitchen. And I'll share with you the Cypress that I know and the baking secrets that make this place so special to me. From the thinnest phyllo you've ever seen. <laughs> That's incredible. Look how thin that is. To a family who have been baking the same bread recipe for decades. That is very, very good. And to finish my visit, I bake the loaf I'm remembered for and share it with friends. I hope you enjoy, guys. Tuck in. Welcome to my second home. Welcome to City Bakes in Cyprus. Cyprus holds many memories for me. I used to work in the tourist town of Paphos on the coast, and I even got married here in the south of the island. As a baker, I can't believe I got a chance to actually work here. When I started off in the Wirral learning how to bake when I was 17, I didn't think it'd take me to a place like this. My time in Paphos was an experience that changed my life. For me, when I came here when I was 28, it was a real cultural shock for me. I'd never really travelled much away from the Wirral at all, and it's very much a home bird. And actually, I took it into my heart. Paphos was, was running through my veins. I loved it. And whilst I was here, I couldn't get enough of the wonderful tastes that are unique to this island. The thing is about Cyprus and its baking, it's all about these few key flavours that are in pretty much everything. Sesame seed is on and in a lot of things, whether it's in the form of tahini paste or sesame seed. This thing looks a bit like a croissant, but actually when you break it open, see the olives inside? Olives are key. Now, dactyla. It's basically like a phyllo pastry, drowned in a syrup. So many of the Cypriot pastries are flavoured with a sweet syrup. But there is one flavour in this box which really screams Cypriot and indeed Greek baking. That is mastika. It's like a gum. You have to grind that down and it releases its smell. I suppose think extreme pine meats, cumin meats, aniseed. It just reminds me of living in Cyprus. Yeah, it's like coming out. And home for me was the Annabelle, a five-star seafront hotel where I landed the job as head baker. We have to catch up with a few old friends if they're around. The hotel is still owned by siblings Danos, Natasha and Anna. You're right. Thank Thank you. You. These guys basically run everything. Whilst the hotel guests soaked up the sunshine, I spent most of my time downstairs. It's right, it takes me back, it's really quite weird. And the girl in the middle there, Ligia, she was our chief bridesmaid. Hello, Ligia. Hi, how are you? How are you doing, my dear? I love being back here, catching up with my friends. It's a very special place to me, and the people are just great. I'll be ending my trip here, as Anna and her family have organised a special reunion dinner, and asked me to bake one of my classic breads they remember and love. Cheers. 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 But before that, I have a couple of days to show you why I love this island so much. And first up on my tour is the capital, Nicosia, where I think you get a taste of the real Cyprus. Nicosia is where the Cypriots live. Not really a tourist destination, this is where you're going to find local cuisine and local people. Nicosia is 90 miles from Paphos and the only major settlement that's not on the coast. To me, this city feels a little bit like a time capsule. Modern life exists side by side with shops and cafes that haven't changed in decades. And my first stop is the Hurricane Bakery, which has been making traditional pastries for over 70 years. Now this place is famous for its cheese pies, pasties. It says here in the window, they are the best cheese pies in the world. I'll be the judge of that. 
These pies are so popular, Mikos opens up at 6 a.m. to serve his loyal customers. How long has this place been here? The shop here is from 1942. Wow. I use uh, seven different cheeses. Seven. Okay, seven. let me try and get this. Cheddar. Cheddar, Eda, Feta, Halloumi, halloumi Anari, Kefalotiri, Little Anari. Little Anari. Yes. So that'll be six. And then one so more. Graviera. We call it Graviera. You have to try it. He seems pretty proud of his cheese pies. Right, gross. You've got all the texture of the cheese, it's all melted gorgeously with a puff pastry that really is flaking. You always tell a good pastry because it's got butter on your fingers. I love Mikos. He takes real pride in his traditional recipes and this place has stood the test of time. A story I've seen repeated all over the island. To help explain a bit more about how the food culture has evolved, I'm meeting up with my friend Athena Lazoides. She's a fellow foodie who was born in Nicosia and now has her own cooking show on Cypria TV. She also writes about the island's complicated culinary history. Cyprus is an island that's always been captured by some foreign power. <laughs> We've been ruled by the uh, Phoenicians, the Persians, Egyptians. Um, we've had uh, the French, the Italians, the Turkish, and the British, of course. Yeah. So all these influences come together to um, form what is today our traditional baking. But I think the key thing is you use ingredients indigenous to Cyprus, and exactly. that makes it your own. Unique, exactly. Athena wants to take me to one of her favourite bakeries, a backstreet shop with no fancy trimmings. I've been coming here since I was a little child, and this is my favourite bakery. This little bakery has been around for 80 years. Mrs. Christalla here has been running it for 40 years. Yeah. It makes very special things like these little pretzels here, yeah. which are lovely, yeah. and this lovely wine and carob cookies. Can we try it? Yeah, yeah. okay. So, I mean, they're made by hand. <laughs> you can taste the wine in it. It's not alcoholic, that's been burnt off, so what you're left with is the flavour. Imagine the red wine going in there would have added to the colour as with the carob syrup as well, which is, again, all over Cyprus. Normally, when you come into a bakery, you expect to see lots and lots of cabinets with lots and lots of baked goods. Actually, what, two, three products that's there? Right. That's right, yes, that's it. That's what they make, and they bake fresh every day. I love the fact that this little bakery, selling just three traditional bakes, is still going strong. To dig around and find a little pearl of a bakery like that, it's pure magic. It's nearly 20 years since I've been to Nicosia, and though so much is familiar, things have moved on. Like many European cities, a new generation is bringing a buzz, and I can see a wonderful blend of old and new. But to really understand the city's evolution, you need to delve a bit deeper into the struggles of the past century. There is one reason that makes Nicosia a very unique place. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, Nicosia became the only divided capital in the world. Before the 1970s, Cyprus was a mix of Turkish and Greek. But in 1974, the Turkish army invaded the north of the island, which they still occupy today. Since the war, this is where the line was drawn, and it cut the city in half. So we have Nicosia here, and this line here cuts right through the middle of the city. Nearly half the population was displaced and both sides lost homes and businesses as Greeks were forced south and the Turks moved north. The last time I was here, which is about 20 odd years ago, there was a wall of sandbags and you could look over it to barbed wire and you look over to the north. But now it's gone. You can walk through, not a problem. Since 2003, checkpoints have been opened but many Cypriots still refuse to cross. But talks are slowly moving things on, and hopefully, we'll see real progress in healing the capital very soon. Next, I'm visiting a family who, despite all these difficult politics, have grown their traditional simple bakery into something rather impressive. Galopesas has basically been run by a family for many, many years. Just like Nicosia, it's a true mix of the old and new. He's just down here on the right. Come in here, you're going to love this. 